Well, good evening and welcome to Quincy Access Television's live coverage of Election 2022. I'm Joe Catalano, joined once again by my colleague Mark Crosby here at the Anchor Desk. Mark, here we are again. We are for um, a state election this time. And uh, we will have uh, Quincy numbers at some point, probably after this um, broadcast. We do have a lot of interviews uh, with candidates and those uh, representing the four ballot questions that uh, folks um, saw when they were at, at the polls. I'd say when they were at the polls today, but of course you didn't have to go to the polls today to vote. That's right, although you did just recently. I did, and I met uh, with uh, City Clerk Nicole Crispo so we have that uh, piece for you right now. Nikki, uh, what can you tell us about uh, voting today in the state election in the city of Quincy? Um, it's been very good. Um, we started off at seven o'clock this morning. Um, it's been very consistent all day and um, we're at about 35% voter turnout across the city. Um, that being said, um, with our early votes and um, our numbers at four o'clock. And talk about early voting and uh, the success, I would say, uh, of having that uh, now in the Commonwealth. Yeah, um, we had 14 days of early voting, which gave people an opportunity to get out, get their vote done before today. And um, it does take some pressure off at the polling place on election day and um, gives people the chance, the opportunity to vote at, at their own pace at their own schedule so clearly there's no reason why a person doesn't vote after having all of this all of these opportunities yeah yeah we try to we try to give them as much opportunity as we can um, that being said the mail-in vote the um, early voting um, in person and then today our 31 precincts are open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and talk about um, how the votes are collected how they are tallied? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have um, a central tabulation facility at City Hall that um, tabulates all those votes um, from um, the first ballots that we put out probably October 12th. We started our mail out um, and we sent out about 12,000 mail out votes. Um, and we've already got back um, a little over 10,000. Um, and we're still getting them in the drop box tonight till 8 p.m. We're still getting them from the um, post office tonight till 8 p.m. And um, as long as your ballot is postmarked by 8 p.m., we'll be able to accept it up to um, Saturday. Now you say all this, and this brings me to the question of why the results are termed unofficial. Yeah, so we have a lot to do after the polls close. Um, we tally those votes from today in the drop box um, that have been dropped off to City Hall. And we also um, have to go with our um, UO CAVA ballots, which are overseas and military ballots. All of our provisional ballots need to be looked at, whether they're gonna be counted or not. And um, we'll do that tally um, next Monday. And um, we should have some stronger numbers then. Um, and we don't certify until a little later on in the month, which will be the official numbers. And looking forward to elections, uh, municipal elections, uh, what can you say? awaits us in 2023. It's going to be another opportunity just like this one to um, cast your vote early, to vote by mail. Um, all of the same opportunities are going to be available. Um, some people really like it and um, take advantage of it and we're happy to have it so that people have the convenience to vote at their leisure. And the city of Quincy will likely see a special election? Yes, yes. Um, unfortunately um, for us, um, at the city council, we lost um, Council Pabucci. However, good for him. We're all happy for him and congratulate him on um, his judgeship. But um, we will um, have a special election in Ward 4 for a new city councilor. We'll um, bring that be um, that calendar before the city council on November 14th. If it's accepted, uh, nomination papers will be available the next day on November 15th. 
and um, we should have a preliminary election um, in January and a final in February. Very good. Well, that's about it for now. I don't want to uh, hold you up uh, since voting is still going on. Clearly, uh, the people that have passed by you in the background uh, are proof to that. I want to thank you for taking the time with us. Thank you. Get out and vote. Well, there we go. My chat uh, with uh, Quincy City Clerk Nicole Crispo. And uh, that brings us to our first interview here in studio at QATV. We have the candidate for re-election, a Democratic candidate for re-election for the Norfolk and Plymouth, Plymouth District in the Senate. That would be John Keenan. Senator, welcome. Great. It's great to be here. Great to have Thank you. Thank you. And I guess um, we'll start with, with just um, your feelings about uh, this election cycle. It's been interesting, uh, to put it mildly. It's been an active cycle. Um, the governor's race certainly has generated some interest, and then there's been some interest in local races as well, particularly my district. So it's going to be interesting to see what the results are, what turnout is, and then what the results are. Do you think the national climate, John, is having an impact on local politics? I think so. Yeah. I, I, I think it, it is. People are tuned into the news and watching, and that's all that's on TV. And then also you, you get the commercials from New Hampshire. Uh, and, and that gives it a sense of that there's something going on outside of Massachusetts in terms right. of an election. So people, I do think, are uh, being uh, are much more aware of more broadly of what's going on. Looking at uh, recent news in your district, a $4.4 .4 million grant infrastructure and housing. Yes. One of the issues that we've heard so much about is the need for housing. And then uh, while there may be a willingness in some communities to do housing, they don't have the infrastructure to support it. So tying housing to infrastructure is really important. And some of the communities that I represent, they have some real water and sewer issues as it relates to future development. So these grants that come uh, through the state budget process and then through the governor's office help out local municipalities in dealing with both those issues. It's been a little while since there's been a change on uh, the corner office at Beacon Hill. So logistically, how does it work? John, when it, when it deals with the new uh, leadership? It, there's really not a, a big change in terms of what happens with the legislature. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's still, we still have the same structure of government. There's a legislature, a judiciary, and then the executive branch. Um, there's always some you know, thought that, oh, will things move more quickly or more slowly if there's a change in the corner office? I, I think the Baker administration had a, uh, an administration that was well-seasoned that knew what they were doing, and I suspect that Maura Healy will bring in a team that's ready to roll as well, ready to get hit the ground running. Um, I think the governing styles are pretty similar. My dealings with Attorney General Maura Healy, assuming she wins tonight, right. and that seems to be the general sense, is that she's very pragmatic and practical um, elected official, and so I suspect that there won't be any dramatic changes. And should Jeff Deal win, you know, I think that will be a bit more of a challenge because I think he'll be you know, looking to make some more significant changes, and we're not sure what those might be. Looking at uh, some current legislation, uh, most recently the STEP therapy bill. Yes, yeah, so we uh, STEP therapy bill is a bill that uh, basically puts some controls on the insurance company and how they can lead a person through a process to get to the right medication or treatment. And um, in the course of that legislation, moving through the through the legislature, we had a separate bill that addressed multiple sclerosis and the change of medications for people who. Uh, have found the right medication for their multiple sclerosis treatment. And so if somebody had found the right medication for MS, uh, oftentimes a change in a job, a change in insurance with the same job, a change in the formulary by the insurance company might mean that somebody who has found the right medication, who is doing well with that medication, has to kind of step back and try a new medication and go through a series of steps in order to get to the right medication again. And when somebody with MS um, regresses because of a change in medication, they don't gain back what it was uh, that they had, what they've lost as a result of the change in medication. So the step therapy bill with the MS component means that people who have found the right medication get to stay on those medications, or people that are recently diagnosed with an illness, if a physician believes that there's a particular medication or treatment that will work, they can proceed to that initially. Let's talk a little bit about the economic development bill. It uh, looks like it's moving forward without the proposed tax cuts that were initially uh, thought to be worthwhile. Yeah, so this is a $3.7 billion economic development bill that was funded with some federal relief money and with our state surplus, which were relatively healthy again for uh, fiscal year 2022, which closed out at the end of, of June. Uh, that bill made its way through the legislature, both the House and the Senate initially went to a conference committee. Conference committee reported out a consensus bill 
that passed just last week. The governor has until I think it's uh, a week, uh, this coming Sunday, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, this coming Sunday to sign it. It is a, a, a far-reaching uh, bill that will really have a positive impact on the economic development of the, of the Commonwealth, addressing some of the workforce needs that we have. We are um, really struggling to find workers for so many positions. This will help in home health care and in preschool and uh, all those types of things. In addition to doing so much more, um, there's about $410 million for housing, for workforce housing, for supportive housing, all types of different housing programs. Um, so there's an awful lot in that bill and we're hopeful that the governor will sign it. In terms of the tax relief, I think you'll see the legislature take that up early in the session if the revenues uh, as we go through December and prepare for the next fiscal year uh, show that we can support doing that. The MBTA is going through changes again. Yes, the general manager has indicated that he will be leaving in January and, and I just I want to thank him for his service. It's not an easy job at all. We were in regular contact with his office. I was in regular contact with him. I'd call him by cell phone if I was on a train and something seemed awry or whatever. Uh, I found it to be very responsible, uh, very responsive, very engaged. It just had a tough time and COVID played a big part of that. Revenues decreased. The ability to do some of the things that had been planned were impacted. Um, but, you know, there was also some major safety issues and they weren't just something that occurred now. Those have been a long time in the making and he happened to be the person there when those occurred. But uh, I wish him well and I thank him and I, I know that the next governor is going to have to move very quickly on appointing a new general manager. Yeah, as you know, the federal report kind of took the Department of Public Utilities to task for not acting as an oversight uh, agency for the T. Do you think there needs to be a change there? Yes. Yeah. DPU should not be overseeing the T. It is a very large, complex organization. DPU has several other oversight responsibilities. I think they should not be responsible for overseeing the T. And we had a, a transportation committee hearing just about two weeks ago, and we had the author of one of those report, uh, reports, uh, former National Secretary of Transportation, LaHood, come in and give his opinion. And his opinion is set up a, sa a separate safety oversight board. It's that important. It's the most important thing for the MBTA right now. I probably say that this is a, maybe the, a result of the national climate, but the rise in hate crimes. It is incredibly disturbing. Um, Representative Chan and myself put out a statement this past week uh, addressing the issue. We've seen it here in Quincy. I have seen it in communities throughout my district. Uh, it, is, it is really, really disturbing and we can't tolerate it. And you struggle with, do you make public your feelings about this at the risk of promoting these groups? By mentioning them, are you promoting them? Or are you better off you know, just saying, oh, these are one-offs, it's not going to happen. I firmly believe that we have to step forward and call these acts out for what they are, and that's intolerable. We just cannot stand for this type of behavior. And so um, I'll continue to do that. Um, we've gotten reports from, again, every community in my district where something has happened, and um, it's terrible. And we've got to make sure that people know this is happening, that the rates of these occurrences are increasing, that it's happening right here in our backyard, and that these groups come in wearing masks and then they just disappear. And, um, you know, they're not necessarily breaking the law or if they just come in and um, have some sort of a standout, but we've actually had acts um, of, of, you know, leaving things on people's lawns, spray painting on walls. So it's not just a matter of standing there with a sign or something. They're, they're taking it to the next step, and we just can't allow it. How is uh, police reform working, John? Is it working as intended, do you think? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. been a little bit slow. Um, the, there's a few things. One, uh, funding for police departments has increased rather dramatically through police reform, and then also with the local aid that we have voted um, each of the last couple of years. Local aid are, uh, amounts are at record highs right now. And so that gives municipalities the ability to fund police and fire and schools and, and other things uh, better than they have. So funding is, is uh, in good shape. In, in Quincy, we were able to get some funding for an accident reconstruction vehicle outfitting. Um, we were able to get funding for dispatch of um, public safety in, in other communities. Uh, so funding is, is uh, really robust right now. The post committee has made progress as well. They ha are still finalizing some of the certification process, but they have worked their way through that. And a few dozen police officers have not been recertified uh, across the Commonwealth. And uh, from what I heard from one of my chiefs is that they find that the additional training that's being provided 
uh, and is scheduled to be provided has been really helpful. And um, that's not just something that was absolutely, you know, that's just um, come to be. It's something that was in the works, but it has been accelerated, and they have found that training to be beneficial. So it's uh, it's on track, and I've, I've heard from from some offices, you know, they still don't know what it's going to mean. Um, but overall, I think most people look at the post committee as something that's really positive. That's where disciplinary matter matters will be sent. And we've seen it in Stoughton and in a couple other municipalities where there have been issues. You've seen the chief say, oh, that they're being reported at the post. We want to make sure that they're decertified. And that option was not available to law enforcement before. It wasn't available to chiefs. And so they know when they have a, a police officer that presents a problem, they have somebody that they can work with to make sure that the issue is properly addressed. The opioid crisis, certainly that could be a program in and of itself. Yes. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, we saw during COVID a disconnect between people who are struggling with substance use and services. And so what it showed was that the services that we had in place were working well. And when that connection uh, was broken because of COVID, the, uh, we saw the number of overdoses and overdose deaths rise. And so there's a refocus on connecting people to the available services and making sure that those services uh, fit the particular needs of an individual. That may be supportive housing, it may be a medication assisted treatment program, uh, whatever it may be. Um, we, we're refocusing our efforts on connecting people to services. Moving forward, John, into the uh, the new legislative session, what will be s your priorities? Uh, the same priorities uh, as have always been. First and foremost, it's delivering good constituent services. We've got a great team in the office. Doreen Bargood is the constituent services director. She lives in Quincy. She does a phenomenal job. Um, that's always priority one. When people reach out to government, you want to make sure you're responsive. And then two, making sure that the municipalities have the local funding that they need from the state. Again, that's good for police, fire, libraries, DPW, veterans, all, veteran services, all those things. And then uh, on the issues beyond kind of the local ones, uh, hopefully I'll be involved still in the opioid um, subject matter area and um, also in housing. Uh, I've served this past session as Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Housing and there's no doubt housing's a big issue. And then that ties into transportation, and transportation is a combination of a statewide issue that's really important locally because we have such a big road network, bus network, red line, and hopefully ferries. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening. Thank uh, you. Uh, providing uh, some insight into our election coverage. It's great. always great to talk to you. Thank you. Same here. Thanks, Thanks for having me. And if you're just joining us, you're watching our live coverage of election night 2022 here on Quincy Access Television. And as John was talking about statewide issues, one of them happens to be ballot question number four. Uh, there were four ballot questions that uh, were statewide, and we had an opportunity to chat with the representative for the Yes on Four committee. I thought we'd bring that for you right now. Joining us right now is Frank Soltz. He is for the committee for yes on question number four. So Frank, uh, thank you for joining us. We should mention that, of course, question number four, I'm sure is familiar to voters, uh, at least should be by today, regards the eligibility for driver's licenses. That's right. Um, a yes vote, which is, as you can see, is what uh, we've been out knocking on doors trying to get voters to come out and support would allow uh, everybody who's otherwise qualified uh, to be able to apply for a driver's license, regardless of their immigration status. Um, that would put Massachusetts in with 16 other states that already do the same. And those states have shown uh, marked safety benefits from, um, from removing that uh, barrier to, to getting a license. And we should mention uh, that this is currently in place as we speak. It is in place. That's right. It, it's, in fact, it was passed and made law in Massachusetts. Massachusetts became the 17th state in early June. Um, but And it was put in place with an overwhelming vote of the um, legislature overcoming a veto by Governor Baker. Um, we had something like 75 percent of the legislators voting in favor. But within days, um, an amend, uh, a ballot initiative was was officially filed, and by the end of the summer, um, it had been certified. It wasn't in time for it to appear in the in the in the uh, Secretary of State's red book, however. So voters haven't had a chance to study the issue as they might have had a chance with the other ballot questions. Uh, so we hit the ground running in uh, the end of 
August, beginning of September, and try to put together a campaign that would explain to voters the many ways that everybody benefits from this law. So, Frank, if you could uh, explain a little bit about who we are, how, you know, you yourself, how you got involved in this this campaign, this mission. Yeah, uh, and, I'm, and why you're so passionate um, I do about communications it. for 32BJ SEIU, and we're one of the co-chairs of the of the committee that is at the head of this campaign. And also, we were co-chairs of uh, uh, a coalition called Driving Families Forward. That coalition included 270 different organizations. We co-chaired with the Brazilian Worker Center. 32 BJSEIU is uh, a service employees union, which means most of our members are janitors or security officers. In New York City, a lot of our members are um, every single doorman that you run across the road, you probably be a member of the union. But here in Massachusetts, it's janitors in all sorts of places, all through downtown, of course, but also in most of the major universities. And most of those are immigrants. So we're one of the largest uh, majority immigrant unions in the country. Um, so it was an issue that was of import importance to our membership and also, of course, to the Brazilian Worker Center. But the coalition that we built, I think, was as a testament to how this bill benefits everybody because it included uh, hospitals like Brigham Women's and, or rather Mass General Brigham, also um, uh, small health centers in the western part of the state and, and uh, agricultural experts and uh, uh, insurance companies who could like to see fewer accidents and um, uh, as well as, of course, advocates. but. I think the, one of the key things that we were able to secure was the support of so many law enforcement officials, including the majority of sheriffs in the state, the majority of DAs in the state. And um, when the law was before the legislature, the unanimous endorsement of the Massachusetts major cities chiefs of police, which includes the chiefs of every city with a population of over 40,000 residents. And for them, it's really pretty straightforward why they would like to see a law like this in place because when they pull somebody over when there's an incident when there, there's anybody has a breakdown they're going to want to have that person's id and if more people can take a driver's test more people more immigrants who might be out on the road will have that identification document so uh they saw it as a win for themselves and as a win for the community at large because like i was saying those other states showed drops in hit and run accidents, drops in on insurance rates. In New York State, they just had a 50% drop in the number of arrests for unlicensed driving uh, uh, just a couple years after passing this law. So it, it has a, a really profound effect. And another thing that police would often say is that it frees them up from having to do these long processes of, of, of somebody who's driving without a license because they're not allowed to get that license. And uh, having going through the entire hour and a half of time that they might be doing that they could be using to actually be uh, working on crime which um is really their major focus yeah. of course to keep our community safe thank you uh, frank and, and we certainly want to thank you for taking also the time uh to um be interviewed by us and good work on campaigning for this uh, initiative this question and uh, we wish you success Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. We welcome State Representative Jackie Chan of the 2nd Norfolk District here in Quincy to our election night coverage. And uh, Rep. Chan, nice to see you again. Great to see you, Joe and Mark. Uh, happy to uh, visit again via Zoom. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what you have seen out on the campaign trail both uh, today and really over the past uh, couple of months. Well, the uh, Maura Healy campaign definitely has been out and about in Quincy a lot, especially door knocking. I've done a few canvases with uh, the Maura Healy team to bring uh, up the entire Democratic ticket, uh, you know, obviously for today, uh, vote, as well as been some sign holding going on. And But I hear from a few friends that the polls have been a little bit slower than they expected. Uh, I suspect mail-in voting, again, is a very popular choice for many folks, as well as early voting uh, going today's election. 
And uh, talk about that a bit. Uh, there are so many options for folks now in the state to vote. Yes, you got the uh, mail-in voting option as well as the standard absentee voting. And uh, you have early voting about uh, 10 days prior to election. And even voter registration has been shrunk down from 20 days prior to election to 10 days uh, prior to election. So we have so many ways for people to vote. Accessibility uh, is incredible. And also, uh, you can register to vote uh, deeper into the election season uh, prior to election day. So as far as I'm concerned, I tell folks, you really have no excuse not to. Uh, you know, and if you have trouble uh, getting a ballot or trouble with uh, learning how to do this, you know, Quincy City Hall and the clerk's office have been wonderful on helping people out. And obviously, you know, you can call my office or any elected's office and uh, we'll point you in the right direction. i just um, like to ask, just as a reflection, looking over the baker Polito administration and um, your involvement as a legislature with them, well, it's, uh, once again, the most popular governor in Massachusetts, right? It's a constantly repeating a theme over and over again. Uh, but, of course, we have a somewhat different point of view in the legislature interacting with the governor. Uh, one of our big challenges I've always thought was constituent services. Um, you know, Edwin's called my office with the RMV. It's a challenged agency uh, to deal with. Unemployment has been a challenged agency. Uh, COVID was a special situation. Uh, I will, I'll, I'll admit that. And of course, the MBTA and uh, some other infrastructure issues around the state, uh, especially the Holyoke Soldier Home tragedy, right? So the big administration has faced a lot of challenges. Um, you know, from my standpoint, a lot of it involves customer service issues. Uh, but overall, the working relationship hasn't been too horrible, especially during the 2020 COVID uh, situation in terms of conveying information and trying to uh, stay on message on how to keep a uh, you know, unified front regarding a major public health crisis. And I do give the administration a lot of credit on uh, keeping us informed and uh, making sure that our messaging is correct to the public in, in a uniform manner that uh, we're on the same page talking about how to, you know, best protect ourselves. Tacky, do you, can you talk a little bit about how you think the, the current economic climate um, in the country and, and the partisanship that, that's going on in the country maybe would impact local politics here in Massachusetts? Well, to be honest with you, people vote with a pocketbook. It isn't very complicated. And we know inflation is extremely high, you know, over 8%. Uh, wages have been high, too. It's, you know, last uh, report in October was 7.7% increase in wages, but it's not keeping up with inflation. And it's constant bad news in the media. You know, high energy prices, high food prices, you know, high everything. So it isn't like, you know, there's enough negative reinforcement on the public regarding uh, how tough everyone's having it in real life. We all know. It's just the press repeats over and over again how bad we all know how bad things are, right? And uh, especially at the national level where it gets the most attention, implementation of policies uh, on energy, transportation, and uh, obviously foreign affairs in the situation in Ukraine, you know, continue uh, negative reinforcement on that front. But, you know, local political level, a lot of stuff is still person to person. People know us uh, at an individual level, they see us out in public, they can catch me at the supermarket, so to speak, and uh, engage in these really local conversations. Will there be some spillover effect uh, on the Democratic Party in Massachusetts because of the economic climate? I do believe so. I do think that uh, my colleagues, including myself, you know, will see some diminishment of votes uh, as a result of the current situation. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Well, Representative uh, Chan, certainly thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, it's interviews like yours that make uh, programs like this a success. No, no, thank you for having me on. I'm just glad that someone will let me on the screen someplace. <laughs> thank you again, Jackie. Have a good evening. You too. Take care. Take care. You are watching continuing coverage of the state election here at Quincy Access Television. We have uh, quite a few more interviews uh, to uh, share with you. We will now uh, be going to an interview with Kim Driscoll. She, of course, is a candidate for lieutenant governor. So we're really pleased to welcome uh, to our election coverage here at Quincy Access Television, Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor, the Mayor of Salem, Kim Driscoll. Mayor, nice to uh, virtually uh, chat with you. Thanks for joining us. 
Yeah, happy to be here. Really grateful to uh, for a sunny election day. Talk with us a little bit uh, about how it's been on the uh, campaign trail leading up uh, to today. Some of uh, what would you say are the major concerns the voters have been talking to you about? You know, just about everywhere uh, we've been throughout the Commonwealth, and I should say I'm so I'm grateful to have a great teammate and more governor. We've been crisscrossing the Commonwealth over the last several months, and I would say the chief concerns we're hearing are growing unaffordability in just about every corner of the Commonwealth, a lot of that being tied to the high cost of housing. And, of course, we're all concerned about inflation and, you know, whether it's eating oil or grocery uh, grocery bills, they both seem to be going up in ways that's making it hard for people to make, uh, make ends meet. I know uh, transportation costs, that's one of uh, your concerns and, of course, uh, Mara Healy's concern as well. I mean, we know we can't have a functioning economy without a strong public transportation system. And whether you're using public transportation or driving by car, on a bike, on foot, it's just harder to get around. Uh, so we know, uh, I, I like to say there's no honeymoon come January, whoever is elected, the transportation woes, the housing challenges, you know, child care gaps, there's going to be a lot on our plate. And of course, uh, the MBTA is going through even more changes at this point. I mean, we'll have an opportunity to appoint a new leader, but it's going to take more than just one person, you know, and certainly some time to uh, both combine the resources, the substance. We've got a real demoralized workforce there. So there's there's going to be no shortage of really key issues that are going to need our attention for sure. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what your skills as a municipal leader, uh, as mayor of Salem, will bring to the uh, corner office on Beacon Hill and how you can augment uh, a, a Healy administration? You know, absolutely. You know, I'm so grateful to be the mayor of Salem for the last 16 and a half years, a gateway city. Uh, that I think has a lot of similarities to Quincy and other communities uh, of this size and scale. Diverse populations, places that were real regional economic hubs in their day and are trying to reinvent themselves and, and be a place that, you know, offers meaningful economic opportunities for the constituents, many of whom uh, come from diverse backgrounds, are living within our, within our borders. Um, I hope as a local official, I like to say it's part of the Get Stuff Done branch. There's no hiding. You're close to the ground, understanding the challenges of both individual small business owners, you know, uh, chairing your school committee, working about working on those bread and butter issues that impact the quality of life in places people live. And I, again, I'm so partnered to, to be uh, to be on a ticket with Maura Healy, who's been a Get Stuff Done attorney general, brings a real uh, understanding of what's happening statewide, has been involved in key national issues. And I think the combination uh, of the two of us with the experience we bring is going to be good for Massachusetts. And we've been working really hard to try and make sure folks know what's at stake and the sorts of issues and, and both substance and style that we'll bring to uh, to leadership in the state house. I think um, collaboration and partnership uh, was really on display in, in, in a brief, just even a brief uh, moment uh, during uh, this campaign, and that was uh, a spot that um, had you passing a basketball <laughs> along to ultimately uh, Mara Healy. That was a fun one to film. You know, we're both uh, college hoop players. Mara was a way better player than me, but I think we know the benefit of teamwork, uh, both on and off the court, and how important it is. Like, leadership is not a solo sport. There's a ton of work to do, and uh, we're looking forward to, you know, doing it together, rolling up our sleeves, and being in a position to help Massachusetts move forward. Mayor, just curious, um, pending your, your winning the corner office, how do you think uh, a Democratic leadership will interact with the current legislature as opposed to the former Republican leadership? You know, we're hoping to have an aligned vision with the current legislature and, uh, you know, put ourselves in a position that Massachusetts can really be a leader. You know, we don't settle here in a state that is known for its first, whether it's the birthplace of this nation or first public school, first public library, first public transportation and subway system. Um, we certainly are a community of a uh, city, uh, I mean, I should say a collection of communities who have an opportunity to lead. Uh, and that happens when you bring people together. And we're hoping to do that with our legislative leaders. We have strong relations already and hoping to grow those in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Well, Kim, I want to thank you uh, for joining us here today. We wish you well on the campaign trail and uh, happy, uh, happy voting day. <laughs> Thanks so much. I really appreciate the ability to connect with you via Zoom while we're out on the road. 
but for all the engagement you've given throughout the selection season. It's, it's been terrific to be able to talk about challenges, to be able to hear from individuals, and to be able to share what I think are the differences in this race. So uh, happy election day. Hope everybody gets out and vote. Very good. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. So we're joined by Republican candidate for Secretary of State Rayla Campbell has stopped on by in person this time. She joined us virtually on primary night, made the cut. So on the ballot for today, and Ms. Campbell, so great to see you in person. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I love Quincy. Spent 10 years of my life here. Really? Yes. Oh, tell us a little bit about that. If you yeah, can. it was where I got my first apartment. So okay. it was really exciting. Me and my husband, we, you know, landed in Quincy and we're like okay it was affordable started here and it was easy for us to both get into the city to go to work he had to go to Dedham I had to go into Charlestown so it was the center location really good for us and then of course after 10 years we're like we're wasting our money we've got to buy a house and the market in Quincy was just too expensive for us and we wanted land so then we ended up buying a house in Randolph well, well, not too to the far. South Shore. Right? <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm born and raised in the South Shore, so okay. I know it very well. So I'm from situated originally. So this is it's my stomping grounds. We used to come to Quincy on first time when you go out partying when you're younger, and you're like, yeah, we're going out. And, you know, we watched the Red Sox win it in 2004, and exciting. it was in, it was so exciting and being in here in Quincy and the energy that we had, it was great. Well, you've already made history, <laughs> yes. uh, right, by yes. being a, a woman candidate and a Republican candidate yes. and, a, and a person of color on the ballot for Secretary of State in Massachusetts. Yes, yeah. the first African American woman to ever make statewide ballot so that was really exciting yeah. and then to be the first for Secretary of State and then also to get the most sign the uh, most votes in a Republican primary ever in the history of Massachusetts for a woman uh, it's been a very exciting ride I'm sure yeah I what inspired it. you uh, to run for Secretary of State uh, you know in 2020 I ran for Congress and the number was lowered down to a thousand in order to get on the ballot and I ran as a write-in and I got 1200 votes but then the Secretary of State's office said that they had an opinion of the law and that I had to get the pre-COVID standard of 2,000 signatures in order to qualify for the ballot, which violated my constitutional rights and broke the law. Now, you have a constitutional officer that thinks they can have an opinion of the law and to violate people's constitutional rights. How many other people has he done this to in the past? And that's why I decided, you know what, we're not going to have a fair chance if somebody doesn't challenge this guy. So I decided to put my hat in the field and get out there and we only need 5,000 signatures to get on the ballot but we got over 13,000 so it, the momentum is there, the energy is there and people are done and they're fed up. He's been in office longer than I've been alive. It's time for a change, it's time for new leadership and it's time to restore the greatness of Massachusetts. I think if you could, your platform includes, this brings me to fair elections. So talk about that and maybe what um, some of what you've heard being out there on the campaign trail. So right now, it's people don't have any belief in the elections. They don't have a belief in the system that it's working anymore. Because why is it taking so long to count ballots after an election? Now, during the nomination process, we saw the mistakes that were going on all over. The dates were wrong on the papers. So people were going and they were worried. Oh my gosh, we're running out of time. And they said, no, the dates have been printed wrong. All of the town clerks do know this. However, some of them were pushing back on us when they'd gotten an email from the Secretary of State's office. So it was like a target on Republicans. And then when we're looking at the whole process, now I've watched them certify all of these signatures and how fast they did it and how efficiently they did it. But when we come to go and vote in person on election day, why is it taking so much longer to count bubbles? When they have to verify a signature during the nomination process, go on into the system, make sure this person's registered, that their address matches, and that this is their signature. And on election day, we're just counting bubbles. But it seems like we've seen a lot of stuff going on where there's just opinions or the way that they want to do certain processes. Now, with early voting, it's very dangerous because there is no chain of custody. And we need to make sure that there is a chain. When you sign your ballot, absentee balloting, there's checks and balances. When we are dropping it into a drop box, 
you're losing that chain of custody. Now, who is verifying that this is your ballot, that you dropped it off, if there's no signature, and we know that a lot of people forgot to sign and date it? So are those ballots going to be counted? And that's why I think it's so important that we have voter ID. Every single person has a unique voter ID number that you have had ever since you became registered to vote. So we should make sure that we're having ID. Well, I know one of the concerns, too, is that uh, folks think that they'll be asked to show ID when they go to the polls, and they're not often. Right. They aren't. The machines are there. I did it today. Like, you, no, we're not asked. And I said, oh, well, you have it. Can I put my ID in there? And she said, yes. We should be asking for your ID so that it verifies. So it pops up and it brings who I am. And then she asked me who my name is. I'm like, do you have a picture? And she said, no. I was like, OK, but she's got all of my information with the town. So the tablets that they're using do not bring up a picture. You're scanning my ID. It should bring up my picture with, that goes with my ID. If it's all tied to the system that is up to the Secretary of State's office and the RMV is registering people to vote, that is a process that happens right now and that is they pass that through the motor voter law. And that's why we have question four on the ballot because if we're giving driver's license out for free after we told black and brown people that asking for an ID is racist, but they want to give it to illegals, for free, which automatically registers them to vote. Now, they, the left will tell you, no, 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 there's a box you can check to opt out. How many people check a box to opt out? This is the problem that we have. We should be voting in person, by paper, hand counted. It's very simple. We can do it. If they can do it in India with a billion people and ID, pretty sure we can do it here. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, Ms. Campbell. Thank you so much thank for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you guys so much. And make sure you stand up for America. <laughs> Very good. Well said. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Joining us now is Jay McMahon, Republican candidate for Attorney General. Jay, welcome. Uh, great to have you here uh, via Zoom into QATV's studios. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, it's good to be here with you. Uh, beautiful day here in the Commonwealth. And um, we understand that we're going to have, uh, there's already a lot of voter turnout. Uh, I've been around uh, the Cape Cod area, a lot of people showing up at the polls. And what, um, what would you say, as far as voter turnout, um, are, you, are you for early voting and the way this election cycle has run? Well, one thing we do know, uh, early voting was low. Um, so that, uh, that tells us a lot um, about who's voting. And um, um, to be honest, I think it works, bodes well for at least the Republicans because we've got, uh, I, everywhere I'm going, I mean, we got people jammed up at the polls to vote. And generally speaking, Republicans vote on, um, on uh, the election day. So if that means anything, that's what we're seeing. It's, it's interesting you bring that up, Mr. McMahon. I was, I'm curious to ask your, your take on how you feel kind of national partisan politics, if you will, is impacting us you know, here in traditionally democratic Massachusetts. Well, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Everywhere I go, when I'm speaking with the independent voters, I'd like to think that they're coming over to us because we have a good tax plan. Uh, we're strong on defense. Um, we're strong on the economy and, and uh, energy self-sufficiency and all that stuff. Um, but the reason that they're coming over is because they are very angry at the government. And they're looking to, if I can use the colloquial phrase, throw the bums out. They are fed up with $5 a gallon gas. Now, I know we're not there now, but when we were, the, the electorate is not having a short memory this time. They're fed up with not having disposable income at the end of the week. They're working their same jobs. They're working hard. And now they just have enough money to put food on the table and to get gasoline to go to work the next week. And this is affecting thousands upon thousands of people, the working families. Now, 
I know that uh, the Democrats like to think that they represent the working families, but I'm telling you right now, those working families are coming out in droves for the Republicans because groceries, the price of groceries is sky high, utilities, electricity has doubled. Uh, Maura Healy was bragging about shedding off uh, natural gas pipelines to Massachusetts. Um, and I've heard, uh, I shouldn't say I heard, I read in the Wall Street Journal that the price of home heating oil is going to double this winter. So guys, here's the problem. And the Massachusetts voters know this, that if you're on a fixed income or you're a low income working family, you're going to have a grim decision to make this winter. You want to eat or do you want to heat, but you may not be able to do both. And they know that. And so I think they're coming out in droves and they're gonna vote for us because we represent a change. What I represent, I represent um, uh, law and order, public safety. Um, I wanna help end the crime wave that every neighborhood in the Commonwealth is experiencing. And I have to tell you, I go all over the place. I've gone, uh, I've, I've been to Pittsfield, I've been to uh, Westfield, I've been to Greenfield, I've been everywhere in the Commonwealth and people are scared. They know it's unsafe to go out to their, their cities at night. Um, I had an event a couple of weeks ago in Pittsfield. Guy got shot and killed right outside the event. Had nothing to do with my event, but got shot and killed in Pittsfield. I'm talking to the cops out there and they go, yeah, this is, um, we may get it a couple of times a year, but now it's a monthly occurrence. Now that sort of thing has to end. What? And you can't end it with an attorney general who's soft on crime, someone who wants to defund the police. And guys, if you can believe this, this is true, we've got emails where my opponent was corresponding with a group called FTP Boston. FTP stands for, the F is the F word, the police. F the police, Boston. Now I gotta tell you something. If you want to be the Attorney General of Massachusetts, should you have this personal animus against the police where you want to defund the police and take away their qualified immunity? I don't think, I don't, I cannot see how that position is going to stop the crime wave and the drugs that are flowing in our streets and the shootings that are a nightly occurrence in, in Boston. Boston's beginning to look like Chicago. And guys, I mean, I'm just talking about public safety. Then we got an opiate crisis, but I have a plan for it. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, sadly, we're at the end of our five minutes, but I want to thank you for meeting with us here today and through us, of course, the voters throughout the I'll Congress. tell you what, I, I love being on your shows. Uh, I expect to win. If I do, you guys stay in touch with me. Absolutely. I will stay in touch with you. By the way, if anybody wants to know, even now, wants to go to my, um, uh, they can go to my website. It's uh, attorneyjmcmahon.com, Facebook page, at Attorney J. McMahon. And if you still want to send an email, we're still answering. And it doesn't go into cyberspace. We'll answer your questions. It's info at attorneyjmcmahon.com. Guys, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much. Good thank luck. Thank you very much. You are watching continuing coverage of Election Night 2022 here on Quincy Access Television. Myself, Joe Catalano, my colleague, Mark Crosby, and now in studio from the Quincy Citywide Democratic Committee, Chairperson Alicia Gardner is here to tell us what's going on behind the scenes. Hi, Alicia. Good evening, guys. How are you? Thank you for having me this evening. Great to see you. And uh, you, you were out at the polls, so you uh, felt the beat today? Well, when being out at the polls, I actually was a, an official poll worker this year at the St. John's location, which has two precincts in Ward 2, Ward Precinct 4 and Precinct 5. And it was busy and steady from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. today. It was really great to see. It was really great to see. Many, this is the first time I had participated inside the polls, shall I say. Um, and many of the poll workers were, who had been doing this for many years, and boy, are they great poll workers there. Well, and it really is uh, a labor of love for a lot of those folks. It most certainly is. Um, they're there at quarter past six until 8.30. 
Um, you do get time for lunch, but you don't. And today, you know, no one was taking a dinner break. Hmm. Um, we were busy um, all day, and that was really encouraging. What were the voters uh, saying, Alicia? What was bringing them to the polls? Um, well, they didn't have a lot of conversing with us or whatever, but they were all very nice. Not many disgruntled type <laughs> voters, and and it was a a uh, election of change for many people in the sense that with the redistricting, many of their polling places had changed. That's true. Yeah. So they were finding that out many of them for the first time today, and even with that, they were um, okay. That's fine. And we, you know, helped them to know where they had it to go. It had to go instead, and they were very pleasant about it, for the most part. They really were. So, it really was a good day, back and forth. The Democratic City Committee uh, mm -hmm. recently held a breakfast. Could you yes. talk about that? That was a, a really successful event. Um, it was held up at the Sons of Italy, and we had just about a hundred people there. It was the first time we were back live since COVID. So, you know, we were wondering what our numbers would be like. So I was happy with that number. Um, we, and graciously, you people also taped it for us. So we were able to, through you, rebroadcast that uh, for the last two weeks or so. So that was very helpful. Um, we had a great MC, a master of ceremony in a DA Michael Morrissey. He was great. And we also had five out of the six, well, I should say four, uh, Deb Goldberg had to uh, cancel unexpectedly. But we had um, Kim Driscoll, who's the mayor from Salem, running for um, um, lieutenant governor, was there. Andrea Campbell, running for attorney general, was there. Um, who else was there? Um, um, uh, Diana, I'm sorry, Desoglio was there. Um, we had Suzanne Bump, our auditor, uh, and we made a special effort to thank her for her years of service because she is now stepping down at the end of this term. And she has always graciously come to our breakfasts. So it was really a successful morning. I hoped it um, introduced, perhaps in some cases, these candidates to our members and friends that, as well as the general public through your video of the events, and I hope it was helpful to people. Alicia, you've been uh, a member of the City Democratic Committee in Quincy for a very long time. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> a very long time, a it long shows. time. <laughs> How have you seen it change over the years? Well, you know, it really was, it's a work in progress. It always is because you are always trying to recruit mm. new members to keep this um, organization alive and thriving and going. And um, we saw a real reinsurgence, if that's a word, um, after the um, 2000 election um, with young people wanting to um, get involved and, you know, uh, re-energize or learn what the process is all about and, and get involved with it and make change. Um, and I'm very excited about that because I think Quincy has done a good job at bridging the gap between the old and young um, in the sense that you need the older people to sort of guide you and help you along the way, um, and, but you need those young people to keep it going mm -hmm. into the future. And I think we have a good mix of that within our committee that works really well together. So I, I've been very happy with the, uh, the growth of it in that sense. And what, um, how do you feel about the political climate on Capitol Hill? Not Beacon mm. Hill, but Capitol Hill. I think, I <coughs> really think Massachusetts is different. Um, what frustrates me about uh, national politics is that um, there used to be a time for campaign and politics, and then there was a time to govern. And uh, everyone understood that and took that responsibility extremely seriously. I don't see that. Um, I, of course, I'm going to be a little biased in how, why that happens, but they have to stop it on both sides and stop worrying about 
every other year when there's an election and govern this country. And that is not what they're doing. They are determined to continue to battle back on each other and it not going to give an inch. You know, the, the, God forbid it's for the uh, good of this country. Um, as long as it's not for the good of their party, they're not going to do it. And, and that's what's dangerous, and that's what I see happening. Well, I have, I have a 18-year-old, and some of the literature that, have been, that has been posted on vehicles is disturbing. Mm -hmm. I, I just, mm -hmm. I, I, the attitude, it, right. it just doesn't seem healthy. Right, right. It, it's, uh, unfortunately, there's such a, um, well, there's not a respect for public service as they once was. It's just throw the bums out kind of attitude. And, and they don't have the respect that I believe good, honest people who are trying to do the right thing for this country, for this city, for this state, um, they don't um, abide by that anymore. And it's unfortunate in, in, to see that. And it, it's just so regressive. It really is. Well, speaking of um, national politics, we yes. are pleased to welcome uh, to the program uh, virtually this evening, 8th District uh, incumbent Congressman Stephen Lynch is joining us uh, live right now. <laughs> Congressman, good evening and welcome uh, to Quincy Access Television. Thank you so much for taking some time to chat with us this evening. Oh, good evening. Good to be with you. And let me introduce uh, my colleague Mark Crosby and also from the uh, Quincy Citywide Democratic Committee, the chairperson Alicia Gardner is here in studio with us as well. Oh, very good. Uh, I'm a big fan of Alicia Gardner. <laughs> As I am a big fan of you, Congressman. It's nice You're to very, see you. Good to see you as well. Thank good to see you. you as well. We were talking, uh, Congressman, about the uh, political climate at uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, what could you uh, say about that at this point? Well, uh, you know, after January 6th, uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been difficult. Um, usually, you know, as a as somewhat of a, a more moderate uh, progressive, I I think I I prided myself on my ability to work with members across the aisle. But uh, so many of those members have left after January sixth. Uh, they chose not to run again on the Republican side. Uh, so the number of of people who that I feel comfortable working with has diminished greatly um, since then. But, uh, you know, the, the work is still there. Uh, I'm excited to get back to it. But I, I do have to say that the climate there is, has changed. So many of uh, my Republican colleagues who actually deny uh, that, that President Biden is our president. Um, and uh, it's, it's just uh, we, we don't have a shared reality uh, on, on, in many, many instances. So that's, that's problematic. Um, but hopefully that will pass and we'll be able to get back to some type of equilibrium where we can actually work together uh, on behalf of the american people because then i guess it comes down to how much work can actually be done in that kind of environment yeah well you know it's always been the sort of uh the workable middle that has tipped the balance on on these bills you know, the CARES Act, uh, we were able to bring a handful of Republicans over, just 16 out of, you know, some 200. But that tipped the balance, uh, you know. So it doesn't take a, a huge, uh, you know, matter of consensus. You just need to move a couple of dozen votes oftentimes, and, and uh, that can make the difference between legislation passing or failing. So at least on the House side. The, the Senate has a, a much thornier issue with... Uh, you know, with the requirement of 60 votes to get cloture. But uh, in the House, you know, it, it's, uh, it's doable, you know, if you have enough, uh, enough members who are persuadable on one side or the other. So uh, at least that's the way I've seen it over the last 20 years. There uh, has been uh, suggestions that the, the balance uh, of power uh, could, could tip uh, from this midterm election. Does that concern you? It does. It does. This would be my my third or fourth time, uh, third time being in the minority, if we were to lose the House. But uh, you know, I think that uh, again, going back to the the you know the 
relationships that you establish with members on the other side. I, I found that I have still been able to get things done and, and get resources for my district and, and accomplish things uh, even when we have been in the minority uh, party. So uh, I hope that that will continue. Um, it is a different time. It is a different time. So the challenges are there, but, but I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity. Um, I'm hoping that we can hang on. Uh, I, we do have some early numbers from Virginia where we have several of our, our um, newer members who are um, in toss-up districts, uh, you know, Abigail Spanberger and uh, <coughs> Jennifer Wexton um, and uh, Elaine Luria, who, you know, came in, I think, four years ago and um, and now they're in they're in sort of toss up races so we're watching that very closely the polls close there at 7 p.m as opposed to 8 p.m here so we are getting some numbers and and those are very very close can we talk uh, i guess a little bit about um, some gun legislation and your feeling on the buy now pay later yeah well uh, we're seeing some um some abuse in in uh, buy now pay later especially in the gun space uh, so most states have regulations that try to delay the delivery of firearms during that purchasing process so uh, we have some we have some buy now pay later uh, platforms that are using the term um, shoot now pay later so they they rush the guns out to the purchaser in a, in a very, very short period of time. And then that person with gun in hand can can pay over a series of weeks or months uh, to pay off the weapon. So it sort of works uh, to the antithesis of, of uh, you know, a waiting period. It, it rushes the guns out. And, um, and so I think, you know, in that instance, I, I think we should probably uh, introduce some type of uh, I mean, there, there are many, I, I have to point out, there are many platforms that, that do not do that with firearms. They, you know, if you want a flat screen TV, all power to you, uh, and they do it. And, and, and there's no, no harm in that. Uh, but even they have seen the wisdom in not doing that with, with uh, high capacity firearms. So um, it's, it's one area where I hope we can introduce some legislation to, to quell that a little bit and, and hope that uh, common sense prevails over uh, both the financiers and, and the manufacturers of those, those weapons. So that, you know, we, we make sure that, um, you know, firearms are not found um, in the hands of people who should not otherwise have them and that there should be some type of uh, vetting process. Um, we've even seen, even in states with the uh, with the waiting period uh, down in South Carolina, for instance, um, the FBI was not able to complete uh, the background check on the individual who shot all those people at the black church in South Carolina. Um, the sale went through because the FBI could not complete it within 72 hours. Um, they didn't have enough information. So under that law, the sale had to go through. The individual got that weapon and then uh, you know perpetrated that that murder um, that heinous crime so um, even with with waiting periods in place we still have some difficulties so i'm hoping that by now pay later does not um, you know exacerbate that problem there are instances where it does provide um, you know it, it does bank the unbanked so to speak um, and and we would we could we would embrace that however uh, we do see cases like the one I spoke of with the purchasing of, of weapons. We also see cases where people who are not credit worthy are, are given um, credit um, under onerous terms. And I think the buy now, pay later um, uh, tactic works to the detriment of those consumers. They're, they're allowed to run up a certain amount of debt and then uh, they end up with very difficult uh, circumstances and uh, very much damaged credit lines and, and, and credit ratings uh, from those same agencies. So um, again, with anything, it's, it's got to be a, a balance of uh, you know, benefits and burden, as well as making sure that people understand what they're getting into. 
Congressman, really um, appreciate you taking the time to chat with us uh, here at QATV this evening, uh, giving us a bit, a bit of your time to share your uh, insights, and uh, we welcome you back in the future. All right, thanks, Joe. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Take care. Congressman. Uh, be safe now. Thank you. You too. And come to 8th District Congressman uh, Stephen Lynch joining us uh, live uh, via Zoom this evening. It's great to see him. And uh, we were speaking with uh, the chair of the citywide Democratic Committee here in Quincy, Alicia Gardner, because I say citywide, Alicia, because there are individual mm -hmm. ward committees mm -hmm. as well, right? There is. There is. There are six wards in this city, and each of the wards um, um, are represented um, by our committee. Um, we actually have one of our ward members with me this evening. That would be my daughter, who's the chair of Ward 2, Nancy Delisle. Um, and, um, and then within each committee, we have members. Um, and they are 35 members, but we're always encouraging people. This is not a closed group that you can only you know, get elected and be a part of this group every four years because that's when they are elected on the presidential primary ballot. Um, we encourage people to join us all the time. Um, many people sometimes, unfortunately, have to leave. And if you're an associate member of any, any of our six wards, you then can um, request to become a member of our um, um, a slate of 35, shall I say. So a, a total complement is 210 yeah. members of elected members. And as I said, the, elected ha the election um, for these uh, people are on the presidential primary ballot in uh, likely again March. Um, and, um, um, but we encourage people to come all the time. We meet Unfortunately, uh, we were supposed to meet today, but uh, our members we're a busy. and we're all out <laughs> there very busy tonight. Yeah. So we, but we usually meet the second Tuesday of the month, and we are doing it hybrid, so that you can. We just started a meeting in person again at the Nage Building, which is on Bergen Parkway. Uh, they very graciously allow us to use their facilities, and we also um, stream it uh, via Zoom. Uh, for people who would prefer that method in engaging with us. So it works out well. It I would, works out well. I would assume that the next meeting would simply be a recap of this election. That is correct. And of our breakfast, because we haven't met since then as well, and how we can do it better and so forth. And, you know, we have to look to the future and how we have to prepare, you know. Um, I mean, the midterm, we talked for the last two years about our midterm, and now they're here and gone. So they'll be on to presidential um, race in two years. But, you know, we will be hard at work, uh, it, you know, with um, um, boosting our uh, Democratic candidates as much as we can. That's a real duty of what we do as a committee. Um, and we d did a very successful job of that when we had a candidate's night with a combination of a number of our uh, town um, committee members, Braintree, Hingham, Weymouth, Holbrook, uh, w and we all had a wonderful um, candidates forum at uh, Braintree Town Hall at the end of August. And th that's part of our duties is to introduce these candidates, not just to Democrats, but to the general public and give them the forums in which to meet the elector at. Um, so that's, we take that seriously. Well, we appreciate you uh, uh, taking some time here to talk with us. We should mention we did reach out several times to the Quincy uh, Republican uh, Committee. Yeah. Um, unable to, uh, to find a time uh, to get them uh, on the program. Um, but we appreciate yeah. you coming in this evening. I'd be happy to come any time. I appreciate your time. It's a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for all you do. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. Take care. And we'll continue with our uh, election night coverage now. We also had an opportunity uh, earlier today to chat with an uh, independent candidate for a Norfolk County Commissioner, Matthew Sheehan. Joining us is Matt Sheehan. He is an independent for County Commissioner. That would be Norfolk County, of course, the county um, we both reside in here, uh, where Quincy Access Television is. Matt, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. 
Pleasure to have you. And uh, talk about um, what brought you into this campaign. So uh, I graduated from Norfolk County Agricultural High School in 2003, and I'm on the board of trustees at the school. So I've actually worked alongside the commissioners for about nine years now because all three commissioners are on the board of the school. Uh, initially, the biggest reason why I decided to run is, uh, the, so the school sits on beautiful land, forest fields. It's a classroom for the students. It's a recreational space for everyone who lives around here. And I'm from Bedham. Um, so many people around here go to that school to use it for recreation. Uh, I support solar on roofs and parking lots, but the county commissioners are trying to put in a 30-acre ground-mounted solar project that would destroy tons of forests and fields. And this is, so, this is phase three, correct? Phase three and four. So phase, phase one and two of the project are the roofs and the parking lot, which I totally support. Phase three is 20 acres on North Street and Walpole, which would cut down trees and cover fields. And this is prime agricultural land, prime soil. It's known as uh, soils of statewide importance. And then about 10 acres on the main campus. It equates to about 8.5 acres, but it would be four acres of trees and then cover four and a half acres of fields. And the current location of this project is where the students operate their haunted hayride. So um, it's been a really controversial project. And I, you know, I think it's important that we address climate change and everybody wants to make the world a better place, but we shouldn't be you know, replacing one resource with another, if that makes sense. Mr. Shane, I wonder if you could, for folks, just kind of explain what county government does and where its funding comes from. I think it's kind of a mystery um, to a lot of folks. Yeah. So the county government gets its funding. There's some taxes that are uh, that we get from each of the 28 cities and towns, and we also get um, money from uh, pro uh, processing real estate transactions at the Registry of Deeds. And the budget's about 34 million dollars a year. And for everyone watching, I want to let you know the county's sitting on uh, over 100 million dollars of American Rescue Plan money. So if you're in a city or town inside the county, go to the county's website and apply for the money and they'll disperse, you know, whatever the grant is based on what your need is. I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, so the county basically runs Norfolk County Agricultural High School, the Registry of Deeds in Dedham. They manage the courthouses. Um, there's about 10 municipal courthouses, you know, ranging from Rentham, Quincy. There's two in Dedham. And they also have President's Golf Course in Quincy that they run as well. I do want to um, look back at, or at least return to something you had said, the Registry of Deeds, and talk specifically about the Information Technology Director position. Sure. So um, the registrar really wants to have an IT director on site at the registry. And this argument between the commissioners and the registrar has been going back and forth for a while. Now, I'm not a, a computer expert, but I don't see a problem with having an IT director on site at the registry to monitor all of our real estate records. Um, I actually think it's a good idea. So I support what the registrar wants. And annually, um, the county, the, the registry of deeds process is about $82 million a year in real estate transactions. And with the amount of, you know, cyber attacks that happen these days, I do think it's important to have the on-site IT director where he wants it. What is the uh, term for a county commissioner, Mr. Sheehan? Uh, it's four years. And do you think there ought to be term limits on, on Absolutely. Those? You do? Definitely. Yep. And I mean, I'm an airline pilot. You know, I, I have a career, but, you know, the issues facing the county are important to me, and I want everybody to know that I loved that school when I went there, and this is the biggest reason why I decided to run. And I'd also like to address, you know, if I can repair the relationship between the commissioners and the, the county um, and the Registry of Deeds, I would love to do that. And I'd also like to expand on the veterans program they have. So. They uh, offer meals on wheels during holidays. I apologize, I'm losing my voice doing seven to eight months of this. <laughs> so they offer meals on wheels um, during the holidays for veterans in the 28 cities and towns. They also provide rides to and from VA facilities. I'd like to 
expand on that. You know, if I could form a coalition of volunteers, you know, maybe once or twice a year, we could do wellness checks on our veterans because every 22 hours a veteran commits suicide. And that's something we definitely need to address and work on because, you know, we need, they need to know that we don't care about them just before they deploy and while they're over there, but that we care about our veterans afterwards as well. Well said, certainly we do. Matt, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and uh, wish you well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And 400 Main Street in Walpole, everyone should go take a walk and see where they're trying to destroy all this land. It would be uh, a terrible thing. But that being said, thank you for your time. Your, your TV station's been wonderful to me. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Welcome to the program, Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey stopping by in studio to chat with us. Mike, great to see you. It's uh, easy to be here. The DA's office is right across the street, so it's much easier to come in person to torture you, too. So <laughs> thank, <laughs> you, thank you for the invitation. You are welcome. You think it's that, huh? Yeah, well, no, it's usually pleasant. It's, uh, and it's much easier when you don't have an opponent as well, which I think that, that has... And I've been very fortunate. So, yeah. Have you, know. you um, campaigned for other uh, candidates? Uh, uh, I felt uh, I've had some winners and losers in the primary, okay. you know, and uh, Mara Healy, of course, I'm, f I'm friendly with and we've done some work with her as the district attorneys and attorney general. So I think that she's in pretty good shape. And I did a fair amount of work for my friend, Secretary Galvin. I think that's one of the hallmarks of this state that, that we run a very, very fair and efficient and effective uh, sound, safe election system, probably the best in the country. Uh, it may be a little slower tonight with the size of the, you know, the ballots and the questions slowing things down. So um, I hope that there aren't a lot of people you know, reading conspiracy in it. I know they're not here in this state or they shouldn't be because I've never heard of, a, you know, really a, a complaint that would, to me would say that we're doing anything really wrong. Are, are there some bumps and along the way? Of course there are, you know. So but talk about, uh, with that said, talk about all the different ways for people to vote, early voting, voting by well, mail. You might as well be a couch potato these days. <laughs> I mean, that you can, um, you have the traditional absentee ballot. The legislature has authorized the period of time of early voting. Um, and that I think ended like the fourth, I believe. And then uh, you could, um, they had two weekends at, at, at uh, some high visibility locations, plus city hall during the week. You could send a fax, a letter, an email and ask the clerk to send you a written ballot so which is kind of like uh, I, I consider it almost like uh, an absentee ballot so it's no excuse absentee and uh, over a million people actually took advantage of it and so a uh, high percentage of them are Democrats uh, you know from what the early uh, signs are a large number of Democrats voted early versus the Republicans and uh, you know, I guess the Democratic Party is about 30 percent of the state. The Republicans are about 9 percent of the state. And the other 60 percent would be the unenrolled voters. But as to parties, I think uh, statistically the Democrats are, will outnumber Republicans in early voting. And some people favor going to the polls. I voted today at the polls. I mean, uh, my friends in the... Uh, the PTO, squad and PTO, shook us all down. So you had to, you know, buy some cookies and, and support uh, their activities. They had a, a, a big table and turnout, so it's hard to get in and get out some of these places. And I have a granddaughter who started in the uh, Squantum School, so I was happy to contribute. And, uh, and she's already been the student of the month. So for kindergarten, maybe there's hope. But you know, we don't, <laughs> uh, we don't try to. Yeah, we don't try to encourage anybody to be a politician. They just, you know, as long as they're happy. So. You bring up a good point, though. There will be a new attorney general. Uh, there, w there will be. You know, after this evening. How does your office interact with the attorney general? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. I yeah. mean, I don't know that she has a, a ton of experience, um, you know, like running a law firm. So she's going to have, I think, her hallmark will be uh, either keeping some of the talented people that are there or bringing some talented people in. So you're so. predicting Andrea Campbell is the winner? I would think uh, yeah. she's going to win. I mean, Stranger things that happen. I mean, the, uh, I guess uh, pollsters to talk about, you know, what's gone. There's only one poll that matters, and that's uh, 8 o'clock today right. when the results come in. That's the only poll that really matters. So people can think what they want. I mean, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Mm. Uh, I know that they're calling some elections very tight across the country. Well, I could have done that without a poll. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I think what goes on in New Hampshire, I mean, they spent a ton of money on, on uh, Massachusetts media. Uh, Southern New Hampshire obviously is covered by the mass media. Right. So 
Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, I, I heard some kind of staggering uh, amount today that um, political campaigns in this country have, uh, have spent $16 billion, and they were saying it's only eight times the, uh, the Powerball, I mean, <laughs> I mean, which is you know, ridiculous. I mean, and obviously a lot of the money is coming in. It comes in not necessarily from individuals but from corporations, and uh, that's unfortunate. I think that uh, when the Supreme Court made th that change to allow corporations to be considered as persons and the, the contribution levels, I, I think that has hurt us in democracy. I think the election deniers, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that on the one hand some people from not necessarily for this state, because you, you do find some people trying to buy into it, but it doesn't happen here. So if you're buying into it, it's someplace else. But think about it. It's just cutting, uh, it's, you're cutting the knees off of our democracy and the underpinnings of democracy. And yet, throughout this, no one has really proven any real election fraud anywhere in the country. They've gone to court, and I encourage that. If you believe there's something wrong, you should. I mean, we've had some close elections. Um, arguably, I think... Um, the last few years, uh, the Democratic Party on the national level has won all of the national elections, popular vote, but we have not won the electoral vote. All right, and we'll see if your predictions come true. Uh, well, I, I think the Democrats are interested in tough sledding in the, the House. Uh, that usually happens traditionally. The yep. President's party, whoever it is, takes it on the chin a little. And, you know, it's one of those things that uh, in the case of, of Joe Biden, you know, got a pretty bad hand he's dealing with, you know, it's, it's uh, the former president can say he had a great economy, but the economy was going in the toilet when, when COVID hit and, you know, predicted the war with, with uh, a role in the war, the war uh, with Ukraine. And, and there's a whole bunch of factors. And, and I don't think there's any one magic answer and any one answer is going to solve the problem quickly. So I only hope I, I'm, I enjoyed politics when I was in the legislature when I used to believe and I was taught in school that, that uh, politics is the art of compromise. And I think in this country and what's going on, less in this state, but because Republicans and Democrats, Charlie Baker and, and Democrats can get together and get stuff done, and they've, they've proven that time and again. Uh, Paul Salucci, Bill Weld, you know, you had de Democratic legislatures, they get things done. You should and look at Massachusetts for the model. Yeah. But, well, Thanks, it, it's just really appreciate it. We're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we, we talk to each other, yeah. and I appreciate you talking to me yeah. tonight. So. Thank you very much. And you'll be back in the studio. Yeah, well, yeah, then uh, we'll get some shows together. Very good. Welcome back. You're watching Quincy Access Television's live coverage of Election Night 2022. We've had a great evening uh, lineup of uh, guests, both pre-recorded and live. We thank them all uh, for participating in our coverage so we can bring it uh, to you, our viewers. Absolutely. It's an honor. It's a pleasure, certainly, to, um, to bring this coverage to you. We should thank all the folks, all the candidates, and uh, those that were in favor of uh, a ballot question or those Yes, those in favor uh, joined us tonight. That actually makes the coverage that we bring to you at home. Yes, we were able to offer, uh, of course, uh, five-minute pieces for all the candidates uh, to state their platforms and opinions uh, previously here on QATV. We're happy to do that, and we will uh, continue to do that in the future elections, both local and statewide. We do have some more uh, candidates we that uh, we have both interviewed, and uh, we will go to those now, and then we'll, we will be back uh, in studio right after. Our election night 2022 coverage continues here on Quincy Access Television with our next guest uh, joining us virtually. We welcome Gloria Caballero Roca. And Gloria is a Green Rainbow Party candidate for state auditor. So, uh, Gloria, nice to uh, virtually meet you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. Good afternoon or good evening. It's so dark out here in Western Mass. I don't know out there. It's dark here, too. Okay. <laughs> Daylight savings time. I know. That's great. Talk, talk about... Um, First of all, thank you for joining us. And what um, got you interested in the race? Um, thank you for, for the opportunity. So last year, I ran for mayor of Holyoke. And um, door knocking and doing all this canvassing, you get to meet a lot of people, and uh, people share it with you so much of their intimate problems and how they feel. Um, disappointed by some of the uh, programs and uh, services that they're not getting. Um, so this year I decided, okay, I'm going to run for uh, state auditor, which is a very um, 
it's an office that has so much unrealized potential, as I keep saying, um, not because it is an executive branch or anything, but at least it's a place where you can um, do some auditing and also introduce or expand the way we audit. Uh, the programs. It's not only the programs and the statistics and the bookkeeping, but also um, it's trying to make the people aware that these programs exist and also take also into account what people are saying about those programs. Are they getting the services that the mission, the vision of these programs and departments and units or divisions have promised? So we audit that. And also we'd like to to see what the future of those um, programs have, um, I mean, if they have protocols uh, taking into account um, what is it that they are going to do for Plan B in case of the crisis or pandemic? Is are there all the funds allocated in place so that people don't fall through the cracks and they feel that there is something like a safety net provided by the government? So all that gets me so you know motivated. I am a uh, a grassroots um, community organizer. I door knock, I am an activist, I am an environmentalist, and uh, I think it's important that people's voices are heard and also be, uh, it's important that we're all treat each other, you know, with uh, respect and dignity and we're all reasonable uh, with one another. So all that got me motivated. I also teach at uh, <laughs> different community colleges and my students have taught me about the problems that they have found and, that, you know, experienced, and they really need help. And um, someone needs to start advocating for those uh, folks out there. And uh, I am willing to do that, and I will continue doing that. How do you think that the uh, current auditor's office in Massachusetts functions, and uh, which ways would you improve it? Yes, as I was saying, you know, this has a lot of unrealized potential. I would like to introduce what I have called a citizen's audit plan so that. Uh, there are appointee people, you know, um, forming a panel that is independent from my office, and that they would hold forums from across the, across from the, I mean, across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and find out from the people, you know, boots on the ground, what is it that needs to be fixed, or what is it, you know, uh, what are the programs that need better funded? Those, I mean, that panel will suggest, will make suggestions to the auditor. And they would say, these are the areas uh, that people want you to really take a closer look at, uh, where funded, um, if, if they are funded, you know, if funds have been divested, or if they need more funding, because it is also true that there are so many programs that are underfunded, that people are being overbooked and overworked, and therefore the services are not, you know, professionally well provided. So uh, that is one area that I would love to introduce. And, uh, and also, as I said, we're looking into protocols. Um, why is it that we don't have a plan B when it came to the MBTA problem? Where was um, plan B for the people that mostly are affected? We're talking about students, you know, people who work and people who depend on, on public transportation. We didn't have a safety net for those people. So those are the areas, um, if we're talking about being an equity auditor, as I would like to be, uh, I would also like to uh, incorporate in my in my office i wish i could <laughs> if i win this opportunity i know climate was also uh, part of your platform uh, making sure that um, climate protection programs are functioning to their optimum yes so for instance here in holyoke whenever it rains we get a phone call from city hall saying that uh, well there's going to be a flood or there was a flood and there was a discharge from the sewage you know, system into the Connecticut River. Um, not only that, we also get reports from neighbors um, whose uh, basements get flooded and this humidity and all that implicates um, the lack of um, protection for people who get their homes destroyed or the basement or people who also fish in the river because it's also true that uh, there's not a lot of food available for that uh, for some some of our folks, uh, they get you know um, not only not poisoned but they do get sick. Uh, Holyoke is one of the cities um, with the highest rates in asthma in uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So when we're talking about climate change, we should also talk, talk about climate um, justice and environmental justice. I, su I should say for not only communities like Holyoke but communities who need programs to really um, invest 
in taking care of, for instance, planting more trees, making more walkable and bikeable cities, taking care of the folks who live in these areas where they get flooded but, uh, when it rains, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I would really like to see the government working closely with city councilors, with communities, with people who door knock, with nonprofit organizations to really pay attention to these areas. And I'm not only talking about, you know, low-income areas. I'm talking about the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, that, for instance, bridges get also affected when we have all these um, massive water uh, when it rains. So it's a matter of infrastructure, of goodwill, political goodwill. It's a health issue, and it's also an economic issue. It affects all of us from across the board. Absolutely, and I want to thank you uh, for so much to talk about, but we only have a few minutes. So I want to thank you for joining us here this evening, and we wish you luck. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Continuing our election night coverage here on Quincy Access Television, in addition, of course, to the candidates, there are four ballot questions that folks are deciding today. One of them is question number two, and that has to deal with uh, dental coverage, dental insurance, and how much dental insurance companies pay for patient care. There's a yes side, there's a no side. Joining us now, Dr. Muhab Rizkala from Yes On Two. So, Doctor, thank you very much for spending some time with us. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. It's our pleasure, and uh, this uh, uh, format, this uh, move, if you will, of yes on two is pretty much solely funded by you. Is that right? Uh, you know, I'm the largest individual uh, contributor to this. Uh, it's close to $3 million, but um, I, I really have to point also to the American Dental Association, which has come in with additional support of $5.5 .5 million, as well as organizations around this amazing country uh, who have brought in even another $2 million on top of that, um, which really speaks to their recognition of the importance of this, um, of this ballot initiative on not just a state level, but really on a national and human level. So if you could explain a little bit about what Yes on Two would do if Yes on Two passes this evening. Certainly. Well, so you've, you must have seen some of the advertising on it, which is all very honest, uh, unlike our opponents, which just is all dishonest. Uh, the, the question two simply expands a consumer protection law that already exists for medical insurance to dental insurance. It's fundamentally that simple, okay? Uh, the law basically protects patients who are paying their premiums, which accumulate into large numbers when many patients pay these premiums, it protects those premiums so that insurance companies can't just sort of waste them. And I say waste them, what I mean is direct them into, into areas that are paying their friends or, you know, overpaying for something because there are, you know, fringe benefits from doing that. The idea is to give fair pay to the insurance company so that they get reasonable profits, but they are not taking unreasonable amounts of money, uh, which is what we which is what we see uh, actually. Delta Dental of Massachusetts uh, in their most recent not-for-profit um, documents sent to the IRS, they told the IRS that they literally contributed, and that's the word in their document, contributed, C-O-N-T-R-I-B-U-T-E-D. They literally contributed $291 million to their parent company the same year that they only paid $177 million for patient care. Now, they're a not-for-profit, so they had to contribute that money. It was not a payment. It was a surplus. This was excess funds. Now, they had an option. Mark, they had an option to either give it to patients, resulting in lower co-pays for those patients or lower premiums or premium refunds. They could have done that. But they did not do that, and the reason they did not do that is because they're not required to. Had they been required to, had question two already existed, they could not have done that. And so all what we're establishing is a consumer protection law that makes sure that patients have fair value for their dental insurance. So as you're well aware, the argument against is that passing this would uh, force premiums to increase anywhere from 30 to 38 uh, percent, prompting people to discontinue their dental coverage. 
which makes no sense. And you know, we've had the we've had the opportunity to debate these things. Unfortunately, the debates don't allow us to get to the math. I would love to be in front of a whiteboard with the people who are saying that that's going to happen because I can take a tenth grader and put them on that whiteboard. And the math is going to go like this: when this amount of waste is no longer wasted, that goes back to patient care, which means patients will have more financial support for their care. That means patients will pay less in co-pays. It's really quite simple. You know, it, it, it is a question ultimately of who do you trust? And I think tonight's gonna be a resounding, we trust the yes side. Why? Because they're the doctors. They're the doctors that you trust every day. No one has said, I trust my insurance company. It's just not a concept we have. But I would even go a step further. You should trust your doctors. You shouldn't trust an insurance company, but fundamentally, trust the math. The math is very simple. You're moving waste back into patient care. It's that simple. So if it's so simple, why hasn't it been a law up until this point? That's a great question, and I have an answer for that. And in fact, um, this is the first ballot question in dentistry in the nation ever. Okay, and and I I, I I I created this ballot question. I authored it. I'm the chairman of the ballot question. Uh, and what I've watched over the last two decades of my career is uh, is different societies in across the nation. Every state has a dental society. Different dental societies trying to implement legislation to try to subdue these out of control dental insurers. And what has happened repeatedly is that these these proposed bills simply die in committee because the dental insurance lobby is very good at finding ways to just stagnate a law. And anybody who understands politics, a stagnated law dies if it is not voted on. So they, they never even come out of committee and they simply die. Then, and that is actually the reason why the dental ballot was implemented, why I installed it. Because I said, I need to, I need to find a way to make a, to a pathway that sidesteps lobbyists. That's what the dental ballot does. It brings it right to the people. And by looking at the polling that we are seeing so far, which I think you must have seen, Mark, the question to polling is the most highest, it's the highest performing polling, right? Because every patient understands, every person who's dental and who has a dental insurance has frustration. And, and they understand the pains that they're experiencing. And they're asking the same question, why doesn't this law already exist? And so they're saying, yes, we want it. Doctor, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you about this, and thank you for spending some time to explain it to our viewers. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Have a great evening. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Please welcome to our coverage here on election night in Quincy Access Television. Libertarian candidate for state treasurer, Chris Crawford, has stopped by our studios in person to chat with us. Nice to see you, Chris. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about the Chris Crawford story. Well, I am a mother and a homemaker. Um, in a past life, I was a software engineer. And I wrote many beautiful programs. <laughs> so you have a very and, mathematical And mind. I now am the treasurer of the Libertarian Association of Massachusetts. And which, I'm running for state treasurer. Which, tell us about the party, if you could. A little bit about the Libertarian Party. Well, we've been around for 40 years. 40? 40, 40 okay. maybe more. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're a small party, mm -hmm. but we're hoping, well, we're probably going to get ballot status because I am the only opposition to Deb Goldberg. Okay. And um, we need 3% of the vote to get ballot status. I see. And I'm projected to get more than that. Okay, was that the primary reason for, for running? Yep. Really? Yeah. Why do you think that's important to get ballot status? Well, we don't have to petition for the presidential candidate if we're a recognized political party. Okay. Yeah. So do you have a, a presidential candidate uh, that you'll be uh, promoting in the future? Well, I don't know about okay. that. <laughs> So, but in the short term, you're running for state treasurer. Yes. Um, so you have, you have some experience uh, being a treasurer of yes. the party yourself. Do you think that qualifies you to be the state treasurer? I think if I were elected, I could do the job. Okay. Yeah. I also have a master's degree in economics with a concentration in public policy from Suffolk. Okay. So, okay. I've got some 
store of knowledge there. What, um, you know, kind of the primary role of the state treasurer, what does the state treasurer do? Well, the state treasurer manages the um, state pension funds and also oversees the renovation and construction of school buildings. Okay. She runs the Cannabis Commission, mm -hmm. the Liquor Control Commission, the lottery. Yes. The lottery has been one that uh, I know that the current treasurer has been pushing to push online. Is that something that you think is important? Well, I, I'd want to see a cost-benefit analysis okay. done because, you know, there's a lot of small mom-and-pop stores that make a living selling lottery tickets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't really know whether people who buy lottery tickets should stay home, you know, and gamble from their living room. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, but, you know, a, a cost-benefit analysis would answer some questions. Sure. I think. How would you kind of, I guess, rate the current treasurer administration and how it's managed uh, the state's finances? Well, we are in, uh, we're near the bottom of the 50 state sort of ranking of the health of our pension funds. Really? Yeah. The, the difference between a pension fund that is sort of like um, there or being paid as you go is a low ratio. So the way it's invested, you mean, is, is no, different? No, it's, it's like is the pension fund being fed by the people who are paying into it? Mm -hmm. And yes, it is. In Massachusetts? Yes. Okay. Is that not the right way to manage it, do you think? Right. It is right. not. You should have a pension fund, a store of money that you're keeping for the pensioners. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. She, she, she plays political games, like trying to divest from gun companies. I wouldn't do that. What would you do? Well, I'd, I'd see where the gun companies stand with respect to the other investments. Okay. You know. All right. It's, I think the treasurer's you know, job is a little obscure for the general public. Uh, when you hear treasurer, yes, you think, oh, yes. this is Yes, I would that also overhaul the website to make it more transparent. Okay. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat. Right. So, you know, I'm there for the individual, for the taxpayer. Do you feel that the state invests properly in, say, job creation? Um, specifically for creating educational opportunities for women, for minorities. Is that the role of the treasurer? I don't think so. Okay. You know, no. Are there opportunities that the treasurer's office could create in Massachusetts that it's not currently doing right now? Well, as a libertarian, I don't think I would. You would not? No. Okay. I, would, I would do less, not more. So libertarian is less, less government? Less, not more. Less okay. government, not more. Okay. All right. Yeah. So will we see you uh, on the ballot again, Chris? Well, you know, I learned a lot during this campaign. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, maybe. All right. Four years from now. Okay. As treasurer again? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story. It's been interesting talking to you, and I've learned a little bit about the Libertarian Party. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, for, right. thank you for hosting me. And you are very welcome. Good evening. Well, there you have it. Uh, many candidates uh, did uh, come in or remote, I suppose, uh, through remote means, found their way to QA TV and uh, really made this night's election coverage uh, what it was and what it is continues to be because we are still here.
It's uh, been a pleasure to uh, bring it to you this evening from all of us here at Quincy Access Television. Thank you for participating in your local access cable station and supporting us in all of our programming. We appreciate it very, very much. And just remember to always support local access television stations because basically, Joe, this is the reason why we exist. That's exactly right. We're here to serve the community and we can't do that without the community's input. So uh, thank you. We should lastly, I'd like to mention, if you'd like to become a member and possibly crew on a show like this one, you certainly can by visiting us at 88 Washington Street, uh, take a tour of the studio, maybe see a program such as this in action and uh, really get excited about uh, becoming a member here at Quincy Access Television. And I'd always visit us uh, visit, uh, on the web as well, qatv.org, or just uh, give us a call at our main office during uh, office hours. Well, have a great uh, election night. Uh, it's been a pleasure for us to deliver this program to you this evening. Take care.